And I thought I was there, and I struggled with it. I went into my boss and said, I'm really having a hard time with this. And the way I got up the courage to go do that was I finally got to the point in my head where I said to myself, either I am right, and this should not happen, or I am wrong, and I'm in the wrong organization. And when it became fundamental to me that either what I had thought through was correct, or I should not be a Marine, when I got to that stage, that's when I went in to see my boss. On a handful of times that I did that, go figure since I'm still standing here, my boss said, you're right. It won't happen often, but you really need to be able to put yourself on that spot. One more thing about um, obeying and disobeying, dissent, etc. The oath of an officer is, I, Peter Pace, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, so help me God. Go read that oath. It's the oath you take. You've taken it, you'll take it again. Nowhere, nowhere in that oath of an, officer, of an officer's oath, nowhere does it say, I will obey. This is not by chance. An enlisted oath is, I, Lance Corporal Pete Pace, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will, I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over me according to regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. Enlisted oath swears to obey the President and the officers appointed over them. An officer's oath specifically does not. So when you're talking about dissent, disobedience, moral, legal, moral, legal and moral authority of an order, that's why you are an officer. Your oath is specifically designed to challenge you to make those decisions. The Nuremberg tri trials after World War II, the German officer's excuse was, I was just following orders, and the world said bullshit. Think about that. It's not always something that's really obviously moral. There are times when you get challenged, when you're not really sure, but you, but you know you've got to stand up to be who you are. When I was Lieutenant Colonel Battalion Commander, uh, my battalion was, was afloat aboard ship. Um, we were off the Philippines, and we got word that um, the U.S. Embassy wanted uh, my Marines to come ashore and be part of a parade for President Marcos. The island on which they were going to have the parade was a known uh, island of violence. Uh, a lot of insurgents were there. So, uh, so I said, OK, we can do this, um, but uh, we're coming in with ammunition because I'm not going to have my mortars, my machine guns, my rifles, and most importantly, my Marines challenged while they're in this parade by insurgents. Uh, the word came back. They said, oh, no, you can't do that. You cannot march past President Marcos uh, with ammunition. And my answer back was, okay, we're not going to march past President Marcos. 
This, as you can go figure, became a very, very sensitive subject. Messages going back and forth. In my heart of hearts, there was no way that I was going to let any of my Marines go into potentially harm's way. There was no, there was no intel that said there was going to be an attack. There was nothing. I just believed that if you're going to put your Marines ashore, and there's a possibility that they should be properly armed so people wouldn't mess with them. And I refused to put my Marines ashore. We went back to Okinawa from whence we'd come aboard ship. And when I got off ship, I got word that the uh, division commander wanted to see me right away. So I'm thinking to myself, OK, Lieutenant Colonel, 16 years of service, four to go to retirement. Uh, now what? What am I going to do next, right? <laughs> I was OK with my decision, but I didn't know whether or not the division commander was. So I walked in and report to him, Major General Glasgow. I walk in, I report in, sir, Lieutenant Colonel, pace reporting is ordered. He looked up at me, and not, not you know, I'm, I'm sure I pitted out my uniform, just waiting, just waiting to go see him. I'm sure of that. He looks up and he says, Pete, I'm proud of you. <laughs> I didn't know if it was going to be, Pete, you're fired, or what it was going to be, okay? I tell you that story because they've asked me to tell you personal stories, and that's one of them. But it reinforced for me, again, I didn't do that lightly. I didn't do it glibly. I thought about it a lot, real hard. I mean, there's other times when I thought about things really hard and done it wrong. But I, you owe yourself as a leader to think about things the best you can and get to the best clarity you can, and then make your decision and live with it and be comfortable in your own skin. One last story like that, which is kind of comical, but also gets to the moral, ethical leadership piece. I'm a one star now. I'm comfortably ensconced at Quantico, Virginia, as the uh, president of the Marine Corps University, not going anywhere. And uh, I get a call from the commandant of the Marine Corps saying, hey, uh, 1st Marine Division is going to go to Somalia. Uh, they don't have an assistant division commander. Uh, General Wilhelm is division commander, wants you as his deputy. Uh, can you go? I thought it was rather interesting that the commandant asked me if I could go, you know. Of course I can go. So I went, and we go ashore, and um, the port of Mogadishu is really very small. We had three pre-positioned ships with the equipment, and one small port that could take one ship at a time. So the ships are coming in and out, and they're putting stuff on the, uh, on the uh, deck, and putting, and taking what they need. And because the port itself was so small, you couldn't leave stuff out. You had to put it all back. Whatever you didn't use, you put back on the ship. It went back out. The next ship came in. So fast forward to we're about to go attack a warlord's compound. And um, he has, inside this compound, T-55 tanks. Now, if T-55 tanks are significant if you're wearing nothing but your uniform, but kind of pieces of trash if you happen to have your nice M1A1 tank. And you can stand off and take shots with your M1A1 all day long and kill, kill T-55s before they get anywhere near where they can shoot. So we're feeling pretty good about this. General Wilhelm sitting in one chair, and General Pace is sitting in another chair, and we're being briefed. And all of a sudden, the captain tank company commander says, Excuse me? The main gun tank ammo got sent back out to sea. <laughs> this is the night before an attack. So I'm sitting there, and I always I have kind of a strange sense of humor anyway. And I mean, it was dead silence, and you could just see General Wilhelm. His jaws were getting, I mean, you could tell he was about to go eat something. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I kind of smirked, and I said, we should do this without ammo. Put yourself 
in the, war, in the warlord's position. Do you think that he thinks that we're stupid enough not to have ammo? <laughs> Wilhelm, who was, went from being totally pissed to being hysterical, says, you're right, but now that we've had our yucks, we're saying, OK, fair enough. This is going to work. But just in case he doesn't believe that we actually have ammo, you know, we need to make sure we've got Cobra gunships and all that stuff stacked up. So the ethical part of this was making sure we, in fact, protected PFC Pace. But the decision part of it was, you know, uh, we need to do this, and we can do this, and nobody would think we're that stupid. So we were that stupid, and we got away with it. Okay. <laughs> What else before I stop yapping at you? I did have one other thing. Don't go away. Two more points and we'll, and we'll ask questions. There's all kinds of things about leadership that revolve around ethics and morality. Two quick points, one I've already mentioned. Pick where you're going to work. Now, you've already done that by coming to the academy. And presuming you go through to graduation, you'll get commissioned, and you will have picked already what you're going to be doing for the next several years of your life. But where you pick to work, whether it's in the Navy and Marine Corps, or after you're done with your service and you decide to get out, if you do, where you work next is important. You got Wikipedia, you got Google, you got all kinds of stuff that you can look up. Look at the organization and understand that when you join an organization at the junior level, you are not going to change the organization. The organization is going to change you. If you parachute in as a CEO or as a commanding general, you get to change the organization. You come in as a junior officer or you come in as a junior executive, the organization is going to change you. If you don't believe me, go look in the mirror and take out your high school picture. Yeah, that nerd used to be you. <laughs> Seriously, if you look at the leadership of an organization, and you want to be like them, and you want to deliver the product that they deliver, and you want to be part of that ethos, you're in the right place. But if, as you're looking at an, as an organization, you don't respect the leaders you're looking at, and you don't like the product they're about to go make, walk away. Picking where you work has enormous impact on how many times you will be challenged morally. Oh, by the way, I can say categorically, in the last four years of my life, since leaving active duty, I have been challenged morally more times in those four years than I was in the 40 years I was commissioned. Guaranteed. Pick where you want to spend your life. Equally important, grow where you are planted. You're going to get a chance two plus years from now to put in your request for what you want to do next, service selection, service appointment, whatever you're calling it these days. No doubt in my mind that some of you are not going to get your first choice. And you may very well get your first choice leaving here, but then when you get into your service, if you're a Marine, the Marine Corps might put you into a particular job that's not your first choice. The Marines and the sailors who are looking to you don't care whether it's your first choice or your 12th choice. They need you and they deserve from you that you be the best leader you can possibly be for them. I promise you, 
if you will ask for and fight for what you want in an assignment and then go do whatever you're told to do like it was your first choice, you will always get another great job as a follow-on job. Why? Because there are more great jobs than there are great people. And the organization starts to understand who PSE Pace is and what kind of an officer Lieutenant Pace is. And you start getting this reputation and people start looking for you because they know that with humility, but without fail, you ask questions. That you let people know what you want to do with your assignment, but that you then do whatever you're asked to do. And that you will fight for what you think is right, and you will fight until you're told to shut up, but then you'll do it the best you can. I can't ask for more than that out of a lieutenant or an ensign. And if you do that, I promise you, you'll have a great five years or 40 years or whatever it is you decide, you decide to go for. I've talked at you long enough. Q&A. At this time, we'd like to field some questions. We ask that if you have a question, move down to one of the four microphones, uh, and then we'll point out who's going to ask a question. While he's coming down, you, you can ask anything you want. You won't hurt my feelings. Something I did, didn't do, should have done, shouldn't have done. Anything you want to ask. It's not going to hurt me at all. He's either coming to the mic or he's making a head call. I'm not sure which. There. <laughs> uh, sir, midshipman third class kid. We've uh, studied the question in multiple occasions in different classes and everything, but I'd like to hear it from the voice of experience and uh, answer it in a little bit greater detail. When the two come into conflict, conflict, should one choose morality over victory, vice versa, and to what degree must one compromise one for the other? I have a very, very straight answer for you that I believe my heart of hearts. You cannot have true victory in an immoral way, period. You might win that particular battle, but if you've done it in some way that is not according to our own uh, values, we do more damage than good in whatever that victory was. You do not. You should not. And your oath says you will not compromise. Only you, though, can decide where the moral limits is. Lim moral limits are, excuse me. So it is possible for you and I to see an issue differently. It's not going to happen often. It happened to me in the most senior job in the armed forces. I'm OK with what I decided to do. People see things differently. But you do not ever, ever trade even one-tenth of one percent of your morality for something that looks like victory in the short term. I don't know how else to say it to you. Does that answer it, or you need more clarity? Uh, yes, sir. That, that's, uh, that's an appropriate answer. Um, can I... <laughs> uh, sir, it, sir. It's OK. You guys know, but I can't see his name tag, so it's all right. <laughs> uh, Let, uh, and please, it, uh, yes, don't. Yes, sir. That, that's that, fine. That's, that, I just wanted to hear it one more time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> While you're walking away, seriously, it takes courage to be the first person to stand up in front of a crowd and ask a question. And oh, by the way, your comment that that was an appropriate answer was a very valid response to what I said. <laughs> Sir. Thanks. 
I'd be interested in knowing um, what those M1, A1 tank commanders thought of your no ammo decision as you sent them forward. <laughs> you know, I don't have a clue. Uh <laughs> The company commander was a guy named Mike Campbell. And uh, Mike and I had served together once before when I was a commanding officer in the Marine Barracks in Washington. Mike was one of my lieutenants. And Mike was the guy who told us. So the commanding general and uh, me and a couple other folks talked to Mike. And we, we made sure that Mike was OK with that decision. But you really don't. You really don't want a subordinate. When, you, when, you, when, you, when you're rolling a dice, but it's his legs and butt that you're rolling, you want to make sure that you've listened to every possible alternative. Mike was OK with it. I mean, he laughed as hard as the rest of us. Part of him laughing was probably because he was standing there about to get shot, and now everybody was laughing, so he was OK with that. Because <laughs> you know, he's the guy who tells the commanding general, We're at, we don't have any ammo. So he, you know. Part of it might have been that he was um, just happy to get off the stage, so to speak. Uh, but I knew Mike well enough. And I put my arm around him as we were walking. I said, hey, Mike, you know, I really, really believe this works. Because there's no way that your uh, 12, 14 M1A1 tanks aren't going to scare the crap out of these guys. There's just no way. But we got time. The attacks tomorrow morning. We've told him, give up by 8 o'clock or we'll destroy you. So we've got between, it was like 2,200. We've got about 8 or 10 hours. I said, you know, if we can get the ammo in, yeehaw. <laughs> you know, but, but I knew we couldn't because it was dark and the port didn't, didn't have any lights. You know, we can, if we can come up with a better idea. But, I mean, I can only imagine Captain Campbell going back down to his lieutenant saying, you are not going to believe this. <laughs> yeah. Did that answer your question, Gordon? Thank you, sir. I'm going to stay where I can hear the mics. Uh, sir, Midgetman First Class here. Um, sir, we've learned quite a bit about the definition of integrity and the idea that we should act according to the same guiding principles regardless of who's watching. Um, I've been around a pretty short period of time relatively, but in my modest experience, I've seen military personnel and the administration in general acting in a very different way when the news media is present and watching. Do you consider this to be a moral uh, dilemma, sir? I don't know if it's a moral dilemma. It is, it is certainly... Um, not the way, please stand at ease, thanks. It is not the way uh, that I would want myself to act, nor any leader working with me. Um, and integrity is absolute. You know, you got two things that nobody can take. You got your name, and you got your integrity. And nobody can take those from you, but you can give them away. So the question in that particular case is if I'm acting one way because that's the only way I think I would want to see myself in the Washington Post tomorrow morning? Why would I act differently when there's not a possibility of appearing in the Washington Post the next morning? Said differently, why wouldn't I be using that as my own internal filter? In fact, I can tell you, especially in DC, the more senior you are, one of the basic questions is, and it's, it, it um, it's almost every day that somebody says, well, you know, if this shows up on the front page of the Washington Post, are we going to like it or not? And it was it's used as a filter for what we're going to go do. Listen, every leader, including this one, doesn't do things right every single day. All you can try to do is be true to yourself. And you can drive yourself nuts worrying about what somebody two or three levels above you 
is doing that's not right. And there's not a darn thing you can do about that. So my recommendation to you is stay in your lane. And an officer's lane, in my opinion, is what he or she is responsible to do. And an understanding of what your boss and their boss are doing. And an understanding of what your first subordinate and their first subordinate are doing. So you kind of got five, five lanes in your lane, OK? If I didn't say that very well. But five levels in your lane. If you will focus on that bandwidth, and operate as best you can every day in an ethical, moral in, in, uh, way with integrity. Your, in the case of Marines, your 40 Marine platoon will very quickly become a 200 man company, will very quickly become a 1,000 man battalion. Because you're focused on, you're focused on the things that you are responsible for and over which you have some ability to have impact. If I'm a lieutenant and I'm worried about what the division commander is doing or hasn't done and what the president's doing or hasn't done, what, that's wasted energy. Stay in your bandwidth and your bandwidth will grow and you will grow and faster than you thought possible You'll be up here in the position that you looked at today and said, man, what the hell's going on there? And you will not forget. You will remember, unfortunately, sometimes bad leadership is more memorable than good. When you get there and you're that guy or gal, you'll remember what you thought about them and you will execute differently, okay? So I don't know if I've answered your question, but my best advice to you is operate inside your own skin, in your own bandwidth, and just impact there and take care of your folks. And that's the best you can do, in my opinion, and the best we can ask from you. Did that answer it? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. OK, one more. So th third class, Kenny, uh, <laughs> you mentioned that you've faced more ethical dilemmas in the last four years than the 40 years prior in military service. As a member of the board of directors of certain companies, how do you deal with the conflict of interest between best representing your company and the interests of the American taxpayers? Like the you know, I got, I got, I got the question. I'm trying to think of the answer. <laughs> These instant gems of gold, you know, I take a little while to generate. Um, let, me, let me try this. That's a, uh, let me try from a couple of points. First of all, as a, as a board member, you're, you have fiduciary responsibility. And your fiduciary responsibility as a board member is the stockholders of the company to operate morally and ethically, but in a way that derives the best benefit for the stockholders of the company. If you wanted to let yourself, you could say to yourself, yeehaw, anything goes. And my answer is no, because the company's reputation is fundamental to the value of the company. So even if you are crass and cold about making money, the best way to make money in the long term is to do things correctly, ethically, morally, to provide the product with a decent profit, but not gouging people, a product that works, a product that gets delivered on time, and that you back that up. Now, there's all kinds of ways that people can convince themselves that, you know, it's OK to do these things. No, it's not. So I take great pride in sitting in a boardroom. And I, 
I task myself uh, to be not